Thank you very much, Marcelo. Thank you, everybody, uh, for the invitation to be here. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, uh, and to get a tour of the museum and everything, it's just phenomenal what you have here. Thank you. I'm going to be saying that the individuality that we accord ourselves is an illusion. That when you look at each other and you see individuals, they are in no way individual. So, usually, when we talk about biological individuality, we talk about these different types. There's anatomical individuality. Our body has one genome. It integrates everything to a common end. Physiological individuality, where the metabolic cycles in our body are all put together such that we have, you know, we can sustain ourselves. Developmental individuality, that we are the products of the fertilized egg, and that's who we are. We all come from one cell. Individual, immune individuality. If I were to put my skin on you, you would reject it. This is another type of individuality. In, immunology was called the study of self, non-self recognition. There's genetic individuality, that the genome you have is monogenetic. You have a genome. An evolutionary individuality that which gets selected, the individual that gets selected, be it genes, genome, organism. Okay, what I'm going to say is that this is all an illusion. That we are composite individuals. We are made up of many genomes. We are what's called a holobiont. The holobiont is the animal, or plant, but the organism that we think of as the animal plus its persistent symbiotic microbial communities. And so when we think of a cow, we think of the mammal. But a cow is much more than the mammal. Here's a cow eating grass, only it can't digest grass. There's nothing in the cow's genome which makes an enzyme that allows it to digest lignin and cellulose. It's the bacteria and fungi in the stomach of the cow that allows the cow to be a cow and eat grass. When we think about coral, the coral reef is made of these cnidarians, but the cnidarians survive only by being in symbiotic association with algae, zooxanthellae algae, which give it carbon and oxygen in order to survive. When the symbionts, when the algae depart from the coral, the coral dies. It's called bleached coral. It's dead coral. Global warming may be a reason why the uh, symbionts cannot persist in the coral itself. They're thermal sensitive. This is kind of the poster organism for holobionts. This is the Termes, Master Termes darwinensis, and it's a major pest in tropical areas because it eats and digests wood, trees, houses, only it can't. It needs a protist in its gut to do this. It cannot digest cellulose. It cannot digest wood lignin. It needs this protist to do this. This is a protist called Mixotrica. Only it isn't. It's a protist plus four different types of bacteria in symbiosis and collaboration here. What you see here are not uh, cilia. They're actually spirochetes. And you could ask whether this is an individual also because this is a worker termite. It doesn't reproduce. Maybe the hive is the locus of individuality. But in any case, these three organisms are holobionts. And I'm going to say that's the rule. What used to be the exception, lichens, termites, is actually the rule. We all live and we all have to live in assemblies. So I want to go through each of these quickly. Uh, there's anatomical individuality. This is a cross-section through the hive that I grew up in. This is New York City, Fifth Avenue and 54th Street. Uh, it's one of the only Japanese prints that will have Frankfurter's sausages and knishes in it. It's by Kitaoka, who taught at Pratt Institute. Uh, but if we take one of these so-called individuals, what we find is that this person is a composite of different ecosystems. There are different ecosystems for the airways, for the mouth, 
intestines, skin. Matter of fact, the skin on the right hand is different from the skin on the left hand. We have about 160 species living on each of us, major species. The whole <coughs> human race, about 1,100 different microbes, major microbes. And it's been called the 11th organ system. It exists in our body. Nine out of every 10 cells in our body is bacterial or archibacteria. So microbes make up nine out of every 10 cells in our body. By weight, okay, it's about 3.4 grams. You know, not an insignificant weight there either. So that's anatomical individually. We are not individuals if you look at our cells. What about genetic individuality? All the cells in the body are supposed to have the same genome, established in fertilization. In America, this is a really important individuality. This is the individuality of CSI. <laughs> who is the perpetrator? Oh, we found his DNA. We know who it is. Okay. Also, this is the rhetoric of the anti-abortion groups that say, you know, and even more amazingly, intelligence and personality, the way you look and feel, were already in place in your genetic code. At the moment of conception, you were essentially and uniquely you. Okay? You are who your genes say you are. <coughs> and uh, uh, Dr. Nelkin and Susan Lindy in their book, The DNA Mystique, said that DNA is the secular analog of soul. It's that which is your essence. And I could give a whole lecture on what, how that takes place. OK, but we are not genetic individuals. If I were to give this picture to my developmental biology class, I hope that they would say, oh, this looks like a Drosophila germarium. Here are the 15 nurse cells over here, and they are Putting, they're giving something to the cell which is going to be the oocyte. This will be the, the cell uh, in the <coughs> ovary which will become the oocyte. And there's some red material which is being transferred into the oocyte. Maybe it's ribosomes, maybe it's mitochondria, maybe it's bicoid mRNA or nanos RNA. But it's something being transferred there. And they'd be right. These are Wolbachia bacteria. These are symbionts, which are active in the immune system of Drosophila, being transferred into the oocyte. So the Drosophila gets its bacterial symbionts from its mother. Well, we get most of ours from our mother, too, only it's not by germline, it's by infection. Uh, we get them transmitted horizontally. As soon as we go through the birth canal, we start picking up microbes from the mother. The microbes also are when we suckle, when we are nursed when we are held. Anyone with a child knows we live in a very liquid environment. And things get transferred. <laughs> so we get our microbes mainly by infection. But they are important. And I want to talk about the genetics of the PA for, for a minute. They, they mostly get their symbionts through the mother. They can acquire them occasionally. But this is whether or not the aphid will be able to bear offspring at different temperatures. And whether or not they can at high temperatures, whether or not they can offspring at high temperatures, depends on their symbiotic bacteria. It depends on an allele in their symbiotic bacteria. Bacteria with certain alleles will allow the symbiont to have offspring at high temperatures. But if it has a mutation in this allele, which is making a heat shock protein, a chaperonin, they will not be able to have offspring. These are part of genetic aphids. They only goes from female to female to female. There are no males in this species. So this is an important thing. At most temperatures, it's good actually to have the mutation. But at high temperatures, it's much better to have the long chain of the uh, the allele, which gives thermotolerance to the entire holobiont. It's not just the symbiont that's getting thermotolerance. It's giving thermotolerance to the entire organism. Same thing with, this is again, P. aphid, Hamotinella, which is another bacteria that lives in the cells of the P. aphid. It gives defense against parasitoid wasps. Parasitoid wasps are those wasps that Darwin hated so much, where they inject their, their egg into the young of another insect, 
and the larva hatch from this egg and start eating the insect from within. And then eventually they hatch through the integument, sometimes mating on the carcass of what they just killed. Okay, so adding insult to injury. So here's this wasp infecting this aphid. Will the aphid be susceptible? If it lacks the bacteria, it will be susceptible. It will be parasitized. If it has the bacteria, it will not be parasitized. However, if the bacteria is missing a particular gene, it will be parasitized. What's this gene? It turns out not to be a gene at all. It turns out to be a bacteriophage. It's the symbiont of the symbiont. That's giving resistance to the entire organism. Holobionts here are really an interesting level of genetics because here the gene of the symbiont of the symbiont is giving resistance to the parasitoid wasp. It's selectable. Okay, so we're not individuals anatomically. We're not individuals genetically. Well, I'm a developmental biologist. Huxley stated that we are individuals if we come from the same fertilized egg. Well, I want to present the perspective that we are not autopoetic organisms making ourselves. We're symbiopoetic. We are made by <coughs> our symbionts. They are active in making us. Here's one of those parasitoid wasps I spoke of, Asabara. Here's an Asabara egg, and here's the nucleus. And these propidiomyodide staining things over here, those are Wolbachia bacteria. Okay? If you get rid of the bacteria by putting antibiotics in the food, what happens is the wasp, if it's female, loses its ovaries. Cell death occurs in the ovaries. So here's the cell death occurring. That's the yellow stain here. If in a germ-free animal, in an animal with that bacteria, here is it with bacteria. There's hardly any cell death. Aposymbiotic, those without the symbionts, lots of cell death. Those with the symbionts, hardly any cell death. The adult reproductive system of female aphids depends on the symbiont. We see this in mammals as well. We see it in our gut. This is the intestinal circulation, the intestinal capillaries of a mouse that lacks microbes. It's a germ-free mouse. It was born by cesarean section of a colony that was raised without bacteria. So you can see that it has a little bit of capillary network. If you add microbes back to the mouse, you get the normal capillary bed of the intestine, which is necessary for bringing out nutrients. Same thing with the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. This is the lymphoid tissue that tells self from non-self, food versus another organism. Uh, it's trained to recognize certain things. And here's the uh, uh, activated B cells and T cells of the gut-associated lymphoid tissue, the dome and follicle of the lymphoid tissue. Without the bacteria, no gut-associated lymphoid tissues. These organisms have an immune deficit. So part of our bodies are being built by the microbes. What are the microbes doing? They're doing what any other cell is doing in the embryo or in the juvenile. They're inducing gene expression. So here we have the mRNA abundance for, for three proteins. Colipase, which is involved in getting fats out of the uh, intestine and into circulation. Angiogenin-3, this is actually should be angiogenin-4, but angiogenin, which as its name indicates is made, is used in making capillaries. And SPRR2A, which is a proline-rich matrix protein. Okay, here's the mRNAs for colipase, angiogenin, SPRR2A. This is in the germ-free mouse, set to 1.0. So this is what you get if you just have your genome there, but no symbionts. This is what you normally get. This is what most mice have in their padded cells of the intestine. The intestine is making six times more mRNA for this protein than the germ-free mass. And if you add bacteroides, you get the expression. Bacteroides is a really important gut symbiont. 
uh, angiogenin-4. Here's your 1.0 germ-free maps. Tenfold difference. In other words, without the bacteria, it's like having a loss of function mutant that only makes ten, that only makes one tenth the mRNA that's normally made. Bacteroides again is important here. SPRR2A, 50 fold as much. And again, when you add the gut bacteria back, you get normalization of many of these enzymes. So basically, the bacteria are involved in making our bodies. They are inducing normal gene expression. This is not something out of the ordinary. This is normal. We've outsourced developmental phenomena to the bacteria. We've told the bacteria, you want free food? You work for it. You are going to help make the intestines that you will live in. And so we find this throughout the animal kingdom. In zebrafish, uh, the division of the gut stem cells, the intestinal stem cells, is directed by bacteria. Without bacteria, there's very little, shown in magenta here, very little uh, uh, division of the uh, germ of the stem cells. But here's the normal. Here's what you get when you add conventionally, this, this is your conventional mouse uh, intestinal epithelium. Without the bacteria, goblet cells are not made, enteroendocrine cells are not made, the normal cells of the gut are not made. You need the bacteria. They are involved in us. Paper came out last year, kind of a mind-blowing paper paper that you say, this must be science fiction, but it's coming from an author who's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. Something is really interesting going on here, and that's Bacteroides fragilis corrects intestinal epithelial defects in the mouse model of autism and actually cures some of the symptoms in the mouse model of autism. First of all, germ-free mice in general have behavioral problems. Uh, which are in some ways related to autism. Uh, this is the work from Cryon's lab. Uh, this over here is time spent in a cage with a mouse or in an empty cage. And this is your conventional mouse. This is the germ-free mouse, which spends much more time alone. And when you add bacteria back, it goes back into the positive side. This is time spent grooming in repetitive self-grooming. Conventional mice don't spend a lot of time. The germ-free mice spend a lot of time grooming themselves. You add the bacteria back, they stop self-grooming. You can get mice to be have some of the symptoms of autism by really stressing out their mothers. And the pups that are born often have an autism-like syndrome of self-grooming, of asociality. They've linked this to the permeability of the intestine. And the intestine leaks, and it leaks all sorts of bacterial products, including some very bad ones, like ethyl phenyl sulfate, which actually is a hallucinogen, because you know you believe things that don't exist. Uh, and again, this when you this is your bacteria, the mouse autism model. This is the levels of this chemical. This is, uh, I'm sorry, this is your normal over here. This is mouse autism. And this is when you add Bacteroides fragilis back to those mice. It gets rid of this permeability and it actually restores some of uh, ameliorates specific autism related behavioral abnormalities. So the bacteria might not only be helping build our bodies, they actually might be doing something with our minds as well. So we're not individuals by developmental criteria. We're not individuals by anatomic, genetic, or developmental criteria. Physiologically, we're not individuals either. The, whole the perspective for the holobiont is just like the perspective that was in the 1840s when the cell theory was being made. All these cells coming to a common purpose. Well, so do the microbes. Each of us is a team. This is a uh, Planococcus, a mealybug, uh, a true bug, and the pathway for phenylalanine. <coughs> okay, Planococcus is the insect. Tremblia 
is a bacterium living inside each cell of the ectoderm of the insect. Morinella is a bacteria living inside the bacterium, living inside the cells of Planococcus. Pathway phenylalanine begins with the bacterium, and then it goes into the symbiont of the bacteria. Into the symbiont, back into the symbiont symbiont. If you're going to make uh, tryptophan, actually. But if you're making phenylalanine, it goes into Planococcus. The last enzyme is the enzyme encoded by the Planococcus genome. Starts in the symbiont, goes to the symbiont symbiont, back to the symbiont, made into phenylalanine in the host organ, organism. We see this in people, 30% or more of the metabolites in our blood at any given time are bacteria. We have a lot of bacteria in our gut. 30% of the material, the small molecules in our blood are actually products of bacteria. So uh, this is tryptophan metabolism. Bacteria make it into indole, into in, uh, IPA, into the, acid, into the acid form. And so you get, for instance, serotonin. Serotonin is made by conventional mice. It is hardly made at all in germ-free mice, uh, the blood serotonin levels. So bacteria are involved in a huge amount of our metabolism. Matter of fact, birth, I think, is misrepresented in the literature. Because birth is usually represented as the birth of an individual. Birth is the continuation of community. It goes from the mother to the newborn. A whole bacterial system is transferred. And, and birth is going from one symbiotic association, that with the mother, to a new symbiotic association, those with the microbes. The mother... The mother's milk contains sugars that cannot be digested by mammals. There's nothing in the mammalian genome which will allow us to digest these sugars. Can't make enzymes to do this. These are not sugars for humans. These are sugars for the symbionts. These are sugars that can specifically be digested by bifidobacteria, one of the bacteria you want to establish the community. Bifidobacteria is one of the bacteria which helps establish the rules for all the other bacteria to follow. It's one of the first colonizers. You want bacteria, you want bifidobacteria to thrive in the infant's gut, so you give it food which will help it to survive. These sugars are for the bacteria, not for the child. Matter of fact, this paper just came out very recently in September that when you take rhesus monkeys, macaques, you get different types of bacteria in those reared by a bottle versus those reared by the mother. That the different bacterial populations are incredibly important because the bacterial population promoted by breast milk makes arachidonic acid. Okay? Arachidonic acid induces a type of helper T cell called the T17 cell. This is, the T, this is the cell that helps get rid of pathogens such as salmonella. And breastfed macaques have more T17 cells than formula-fed macaques. And also, they, get, they, they are healthier animals. So you look at the number of T17 cells versus those reared by the mother versus those nursery-fed. And you get a different population of bacteria and a potentially very important population of bacteria. So we are not developmentally, we are not genetically, we're not physiologically, we're not anatomical individuals. Evolutionarily, Lynn Margulis, who really started this whole modern wave of symbiosis research going, said, in short, I believe that most evolutionary novelty arose and still arises directly from symbiosis. Life did not take over the globe by combat, but by networking. Okay. How does symbiosis work in evolution? Three ways. One is the way I showed you before, holobiont variation, like the P aphids, where the variant in the symbiont affects the entire individual. It can also have selective mating <coughs> preferences. And this can be done in two ways. One is by cytoplasmic incompatibility. This is Bordenstein's work, where you have a population of organisms 
They get infected by different symbionts. They, are, they realign their genes. They have this genome works with this symbiont. This other genome works with another symbiont. As a result, you can't interbreed. You have reproductive isolation, beginning of speciation. You also have something really interesting, that symbiotic bacteria might be responsible for mating preferences. And this is, they found lactobacillus, which is not found on molasses food, but is found on starch. And anecdotally, bacteria that eat starch, like other, uh, Drosophila that eat starch, like other Drosophila that eat starch, Drosophila that ate molasses when they were larvae, like other Drosophila that eat molasses, apparently, these bacteria are able to modify the contact pheromones that are on the cuticle of Drosophila. Okay, I just want to end, and do I have time to... Yes, please. What? Yes, you do. Okay, good. I just want to end by saying that, first of all, we're not individuals. hope I've shown that. But I also want to say we never were individuals. That there's evidence now that suggests that the beginnings of multicellularity had a bacterial composition to them. So when you look at uh, when you look at coanoflagellates, this particular species of coanoflagellates, which is being looked at in uh, Nicole King's lab at Berkeley, if you grow them in distilled water, they'll produce more and more one-celled coanoflagellate. And coanoflagellates are the closest thing we know. They're probably the sister group to animals. They're the closest things that are not animals that are related to animals. But if you grow these coanoflagellate uh, protists in algorophagous bacteria, which is a bacteroides-like bacteria, their cell division changes, and they develop these rosettes. These rosettes have cytoplasmic continuity between the cells, and they have an extracellular matrix. They resemble epithelium. And so you can go from unicellular to multicellular through this agency of bacteria, which seems to be acting as a catalyst for this. Uh, they, Nicole King's lab even has isolated the molecules that are being produced by algorophagus uh, in order to affect this change. So we are not individuals. Either anatomically, nine out of every ten cells is a microbe. Physiologically, now I could go into a lot of data showing about disease and showing how co-metabolism is critically important. Some of you might have seen the stuff on quasiorcor, which was listed as a protein deficiency disease until 2013. Then it was found that quasiorcor protein deficiency, you get the disease only if you have certain types of bacteria and not others. Developmental individuality, the gut microbes help build our guts and immune systems. In the squid, it uh, uh, makes the light organ, prevents ovarian cell death in Asavara. We find in every animal we look at, developmental symbiosis. Immune individuality, the microbes actually help make the immune system. I didn't go into any of this data, but when I was taking immunology, I learned that the immune system was our defensive weaponry, Schutzwaffe of the body, that this was to hold off this nasty outside world. Actually, the immune system welcomes in certain bacteria. It's not so much an army as it is a series of bouncers at bars. It knows who to let in. It knows who to keep out. They're really strict passport control agents. They're not an army. Genetic individuality. Our genome evolved with that of the microbes. We have 150 times more microbial genes than we have genes from the zygote. And evolutionary individuality, symbionts can provide, selecti can provide selectable variation, and they can be involved in reproductive isolation. So I want to put forth the notion that we exist as teams, we develop as teams, and that we evolve as teams. This is selection of the whole of biotech. This is the way life exists on Earth. The rhizobacterial legumes, the nitrogen fixation, the mycorrhizal interaction of plant roots and seeds, endophytic fungi for protection against desiccation, coral reefs and tidal seagrass systems, 
all are symbiotic relationships, and it's within these huge symbioses that smaller symbiotic webs that we call organisms exist and are the product of ancient symbioses of what we call cells. Symbiosis is the strategy of life on Earth. So this talk is being given to you by Tim Scott Gilbert. I wish I could get one of the Formula Four, you know, racing things with all my sponsors on the middle. Back to Roy. Okay. And we are all holobionts. We are all lichens. And I'll just leave this up in case you want to take notes on uh, where some of this is published. But thank you very much. There's much I enjoy about this, but uh, I think for me the highlight was, was when you said in your New York accent, you want free food, you work for it. <laughs> um, but, um, well, I guess, uh, are there any questions, comments? So would you yeah. say that uh, a, team, as a, as a team as you is an individual, finally? Yes, uh, as so a whole of yeah. Yep, so I, I, am, an individual. I am an individual whole of so I think it's a new, type, a new type of individuality. It's not just me, but it's all those microbes that you don't see, which allow me to do the things I do. But you are also integrated in society, so should one define the term individuality at different, at different levels? At totally different levels, yeah. And so each of my cells, in a way, is an individual. But you know, certainly, uh, I think there's societies can be looked at as individuals. I don't know if it's a metaphor or an analogy. I don't know if it's homology or analogy. But I think that certain rules apply. One thing which uh, the rules by which our body gets colonized. <laughs> Interesting metaphor, colonized. <laughs> you know, and it's the colon that's being colonized. Um, uh, the, 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 the rules by which we get colonized are the rules of island biogeography. You know, it's the first settlers, the ones who can get in first, make the rules for the next group, and that community makes the rules for the next group. And so, when John Dunn said, "No man is an island," he was right sociologically, but biologically, now nah, that's exactly who we are. You know, to a bacteroides, yeah, we're, we are, we're the milieu for the bacteroides. We are the island. And I think that there's a lot of things that this is telling us about society and how societies exist and coexist, which I think is really interesting. We'll get into that later. So uh, the, the book that uh, you wrote, that I, uh, textbook that I much enjoy is the uh, ecological, mm -hmm. uh, developmental biology. So I think uh, Scott has been one of the main figures in bringing ecology to Ivo Divo. And uh, I think that very much has to do with the subject we oh, yeah. presented uh, yeah. today. And uh, I have a question, but maybe somebody in the audience uh, wants to ask something. Uh, I can just comment on that. Please. One thing about this is that you'll see in this talk that the, that the fields, ecology and developmental biology, are being merged. Mm -hmm. And that uh, here's a place where, you know, when knowledge is kind of sensational, we put cook, you know, a cookie cutter on knowledge. And here's where development and ecology, two fields which very rarely get talked about together, I think come together in a real radical fusion. Karel and then Christian. Karel? Yeah, yes. here, well, I was just wondering whether it has any implications for other things, such as. Um, um, the hyper hygienic conditions that we create that doesn't allow these islands to be infected. Yeah, yeah. And so, for instance, allergies and so on. Is there any indication that these connections, yep. that, that, that actually this concept helps yes. us understand that? Yeah, uh, the hygiene hypothesis, which <coughs> states that in becoming so obsessed with bacteria, being bad guys, we missed on the bacteria. We, we're killing the good guys. And Martin Bassler in New York City has written a number of really interesting articles on the fact that there are certain bacteria that might be needed in the body at a particular time and place. They might not be in large quantities, but they're needed there. 
or that function is needed. And in getting rid of bacteria, you know, from your skin and from, you know, your body in, in general, we might be missing out on getting these good bacteria. As mentioned before, uh, uh, you know, the bac bacteroides is needed uh, for permeability of the membranes. There's evidence coming out now that Heliobacter pylori, which was the bad, the baddest of the bad, this was the one that causes gastric cancer. Well, there are some populations where you know three quarters of the population have Heliobacter, but very few people have gastric cancer. Heliobacter might be one of the bacteria which actually gets rid of a predisposition for asthma. It might actually help us avoid being asthmatic in most people. But in some people, where there's a mismatch between the strain of Heliobacter and their own genome, uh, you can develop cancer. But Heliobacter probably originally was a good bacteria, which might have actually helped us uh, avoid respiratory distress. Yes. Yeah. So to follow up on that, um, antibiotic use over, I mean, well, in the States, you, you've got in a the States cough, the doctor huge. gives you antibiotics, right? Yes, the what antibiotics for viral infections. Yeah, right. <laughs> 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 yeah. So, so is there any evidence that it actually kills off all these good bacteria and that it affects yeah. your health in other ways yeah. downstream? Uh, there hasn't been, I mean, there's epidemiological evidence. Mm -hmm. You know, there's evidence from, you know, big cohort studies that suggest that certain that certain populations that don't have uh, exposure to bacteria are more at risk than others. But there, I don't know of any which says, okay, here's a group of obsessive hand wipe, you know, washers and what happens to them. Uh, certainly the evidence exists that people who grow up on farms have much less asthma than the people who grew up in cities. Uh, so there, there's anecdotal stuff and there's epidemiological stuff but I don't know of anything where they say, aha, here's a, here's a chain of causation between the two. Yeah. Yeah, as well, it goes in the same direction. Um, how about vaccinations and their effect? Uh, the vaccinations are usually really specific, and they're usually against viruses rather than, uh, than bacteria, although you do get, uh, you know, like this, uh, you, get, you do get some antibacterial, but usually they're really specific. I don't know of cross reactivity to you know to pathogens, but I don't think you know. I'm trying to think of you know the polio, which is against virus and stuff. The the there's such specificity there for that particular pathogen. I don't think there's a problem. I don't know if there is or not, but I don't think there. One question yeah. Scott, which is um, uh, so you talk about teams, and mm -hmm. uh, so one shouldn't be carried away with uh, metaphors and so on, which can be misleading. But, but nevertheless, you know it's this um, symbiosis and co somehow collaboration mm -hmm. and so on. And this is a very original and wonderful talk, but it's not the first time that I, I see this subject. Also, mm -hmm. in part because of having read some of the stuff that mm -hmm. you have written, like in this uh, textbook. And, uh, and I see in other areas, like in anthropology, the, the idea of cooperation uh, is becoming more yeah. has become more prominent uh, for many years. And that's not the discourse that even in my uh, well, I guess I'm getting older, but in, as I, when, uh, when I was a grad student, uh, it wasn't the talk so no. much about cooperation as no. it is today. So is there a, is there a discourse that is um, is there something going on in the world that? Um, uh, it's not that I'm talking of social construction of, mm -hmm. of uh, science that is yeah. independent of some real facts, mm -hmm. but are there things going on that are leading us to come out with these um, ideas of cooperation and teams and so on? And could this be the, something connection to globalization and to uh, the need to somehow come to terms with uh, living together and so on? Or do you see anything on yeah, it's, it's, that is, I think, the question. Thank you. Uh, this is what I'm trying to wrap my head around, uh, is because you see, all of a sudden, this, you know, in the past 10 years, a whole interest in cooperation as well as competition. And 
in the field of symbiosis, it's always, you know, the symbiosis thing has always been there. There's always been a, a community looking at symbiosis and saying, this is where social models can come from. I mean, the Russians were doing this, you know, even before communism. They were talking about symbiosis uh, and the need for interactions, and they were making the jump to social metaphors. They're, they were making the jump to society. Uh, in symbiosis research today, it really got started through high throughput RNA analysis and PCR. You know, PCR to find out who the microbes are, you know, which, the, and high throughput RNA to look to see what they were doing. Uh, the fact that they're inducing gene expression in our intestinal cells. And, you know, I don't know if this would have gone unnoticed were it not for the fact that the community in general is starting to look at non-competitive uh, aspects of society. The whole, uh, uh, in America, uh, civil society uh, studies only started about 15 years ago, I think. So this is something new. I think we're looking for a new metaphor of evolution besides that of competition. I don't think we need have to get rid of competition. And competition might be between holobionts, which gets into a whole thing about group selection. But I think that there is a kind of search for looking at mechanisms of community which are not based on hierarchy and competition. So I, you cited Margolis, not surprisingly, yeah. and uh, I think her first writings were, were from 78. Yeah. So Dawkins, uh, the selfish gene was from 76, but I guess Margolis was, you know, she was a member of the National Academy mm -hmm. and uh, I think she passed away a couple of years she, ago. Yeah, she died. But, um, but uh, anyway, um, my point is that maybe Margulis' ideas were very revolutionary at the time, but uh, now they are more uh, yeah. less surprising or less. Uh, they're less surprising, surprising. and uh, and there's a wonderful debate between Dawkins and Margulis. Uh, it's uh, it's on the web, uh, and at one point in the debate, Dawkins says, "Why do we need all this symbiosis? You, you know, why do you bring this into the discussion of you know we can explain evolution fine." With alleles, why do we need symbionts? And her answer was, because they're there. <laughs> you know? and, and she was also asked by a reporter, and this is in Discover Magazine, uh, right before she died, she said, was asked, so Dr. Margulis, do you consider your views controversial? And her response is, no, I consider them correct. <laughs> I think that, uh, you know, and this was before, a lot of this, most of what I've been talking about is, you know, 2010 onwards. Uh, I have to revise that chapter in the book, the chapter in the book uh, on eco-developmental biology. This chapter is doubled. Uh, there are some things here which I think, I think that uh, you mentioned the uh, antibiotics. I think probiotics is the flip side of that. And are we going to have genetically modified probiotics to change our bodies. It's much easier to mutate a bacteria than a person. You know, are, are we going to be able to change the way we think by adding bacteria? Are we going to be able to change our mood, our health, our dispositions? Are we going to be able to get thin? Are we going to be able to add muscle mass by bacteria? Mm -hmm. I think these are big questions of bioethics right now. Christian? Yeah. Um, I'm wondering what do you think is the Actually, actually, a difference between parasitism and symbiotics. Okay. Symbiosis. Okay. I've been using symbiosis as a kind. Of, I, I, your, I've been talking about the mutualistic side of symbiosis, except when I talked about parasitoids. There's a whole other parasitism, which is gets into the competition things, not how we build our bodies. I'm trying in this lecture to talk about, you know how we are composite organisms, how we are chimeras of 106 species or so of organisms. But there are also the parasites who will take advantage of this. And the para I think that parasitology is being revolutionized now. Parasitology had been you know, marginalized. You know, schools don't teach it anymore. But I think now, with the molecular techniques and the new interest in symbiosis, people say, 
well, what about these parasites? Well, parasites you read about in, what is it, Current Topics Neglected Tropical Disease. I think that's a typo of it. I mean, you know, these are the neglected diseases. These are diseases that people in the North and West don't get. Okay, but there's a whole new interest in this, and one of the things you've probably read the toxoplasmosis story where toxoplasmosis can change the rat's behavior mm -hmm. so that the rat doesn't fear cat urine anymore. It doesn't have a negative reaction. And the new paper says that this might be due to the ability of toxoplasmosis to demethylate the uh, vaso arginine vasopressin gene. So it's not making argin so it's making more arginine vasopressin, which is saying, oh, fine, cat urine, doesn't matter to me. Uh, and changing the behavior so that toxoplasmosis can be transmitted. So I think that the parent, you know, we've been talking life cycles of the good and the worthy, right? But there are also these parasite life cycles, which are unbelievable. And if you've studied parasitology, science fiction is tame. In mm -hmm. fact, science fiction is based on parasitology sometimes if you've looked at alien, <laughs> whatever. So I think that there's a whole new interest in life cycles in general. And the parasite life cycles are absolutely fascinating and totally improbable. So I think there's, that this field has brought them back into prominence as well. Maybe a variation on this theme. Uh, we have mutualistic uh, interactions between, say, the body and all these organisms, these microorganisms. But is across the whole trajectory of abundance, is that interaction positive, or can a symbiont turn parasite or disease or something nasty if, if something goes wrong? Yeah. Or is has has this coevolution been so perfect that uh, they really love yeah. us and <laughs> us, uh, yeah. they know they can't exist without us? Yeah, they're they're. There seems to be multiple answers to that question. And one of them is that we have so co-evolved with these that now we're co-developing with them. Uh, and the other is there are all these newbies out there who want in and who have to be tested first. Uh, and there are some species which obviously have turned on us, uh, like uh, uh, it's Neisseria. Uh, there's the, there are most Neisseria, I think, get along with us fine, but the ones for gonorrhea and the ones for meningitis, they seem to be very closely related to our symbionts, but they've turned really bad, and the immune system has to know the, the difference. But yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, the Bacteroides story is almost comical in how we co-evolved with them. I told you that we, that Bacteroides tells our intestinal cells Make angiogenin-4. Angiogenin-4 helps make capillaries good. Angiogenin-4 has another function. It's bacterial bactericidal against listeria bacteria, which is the major competitor of bacteroides. Mm -hmm. So we are doing the dirty work for bacteroides. Bacteroides can't kill off listeria itself. We do it for them. OK, you know, you help me, I'll help you. You know, it's a good New York, you know. <laughs> so it's, it's we we really are co-evolved and co-developing with bacteroides. Uh, and again, it might have been something which starts off much multicellularity, for all we know. It's certainly prevalent. But then there, as I said, there are all these newcomers who want in. Well, uh, we thank you once again, Scott, for this uh, very interesting talk. And then uh, we take a break. Remember, you can uh, grab a drink and bring it inside. And it uh, can be wine, can be anything you want. And then, uh, and then we start again shortly after 7 and look forward to Eric's uh, talk. Thank you.